Okay, we're going to get started. I just want to start. Want to start with a couple of announcements. Several of you have asked me about the video, and uh, I wanted to use the video that's being recorded by the videographer from OpenCourseWare. Uh, it looks like the, the, those things are going to take a day or two, and I'm not yet sure how it's going to look. So uh, for this today's lecture, I'm going to do the UCI replay as well. And then we'll be able to have a look at both of them. But there will be a video available from the first lecture sometime in the next 24 hours. So uh, you'll have that at least. And if that looks good, we'll just continue with that. It's, uh, or we'll do both that in the UCI replay. The second announcement is that I just checked. And right now, the enrollment in the course is down to 158, which means there's room for two. If there's uh, any undergrads who've been trying to get in, uh, you can try now. But if there's others who are wavering and not sure if, what, if they want to stay, you can remember that winter quarter, this course is offered again. Same class, different instructors, same book. Uh, so if your schedules are you know, flexible and you want to take a winter quarter, you can do that as well. But as usual, we have people dropping, and there will be more. So I expect everybody who wants to get into the course probably will. No guarantees, but it's heading that direction. OK, so today's lecture is going to be really a parts list of the major cell types and organs that are involved in the immune responses that we're going to talk about. Uh, so let's just get started and talk about how the immune system all starts by a process known as hematopoiesis, in which cells uh, develop into all the cells of the immune system as well as red blood cells and platelets. This occurs at different places at different times during development. In the early uh, part of the fetal life, it occurs in the yolk sac. And then hematopoiesis is transferred to the fetal liver and the spleen. And then before birth, it it's transferred into the bone marrow, which is where it continues after birth and throughout life. But if you study the early development of the immune system in mice, for example, you would study it in the fetal liver or even earlier in the yolk sac. The bone marrow is where it happens in adults and, uh, and after birth, so we'll talk about that uh, in this class. Now, this is the family tree of all the cells in the immune system, as well as the red blood cells and the platelets. And you should really memorize this chart and learn to recognize all the cell types. They all come with their own little icons that distinguish them and are used throughout the book. So it's easy to see them just by their shape and characteristics. And the names are shown below them in this particular chart. But it all starts with one cell called the hematopoietic stem cell, which is pluripotent, which means it has potential to be multiple different cell types. It's not. Uh, like an embryonic stem cell that can become a neuron, for example. But a hematopoietic stem cell has the potential to be any other cell in the immune system, as well as a platelet or a red blood cell, known as an erythrocyte. Now, the first thing that happens with a stem cell, of course, is that it, when it divides, it can renew itself. But it can also create a daughter cell that's committed to become something else. And the next step in, in the development of the immune system is creation of a daughter cell that's known as a progenitor. Uh, that's now committed to a subset of the different fates down here. And we call these three progenitors the common lymphoid progenitor, the common myeloid progenitor, and the common erythroid megakaryocyte progenitor, which is a mouthful. Uh, but, and we won't talk much about this arm of the class, of, of the tree. In fact, in this class, it's called immunology with hematology. Hematology is more the study of red blood cells and blood groups and platelets and clotting. Uh, a little bit of leukemia, lymphoma, and different blood diseases. We'll touch on a few of those briefly, but this class is really an immunology class. It's concerned with the white blood cells on this side of the chart. Now, if you start from the common lymphoid progenitor, you can see that they give rise. Uh, the three mature cell types that uh, they give rise to are the B cells, shown here. Uh, and these are antibodies on the surface of the B cell, the T cells, and then the natural killer or NK cells. And you'll notice that there's a precursor that's in between the common lymphoid progenitor and the T and the NK cells. So it, uh, the B cell splits off earlier, and then there's a common precursor for the T cell and the NK cell. And we'll get back to these uh, further differentiated lymphocytes later. Now, if you start from the common myeloid progenitor, that also gives rise to two more committed progenitors known as, in this case, precursors. So just from the nomenclature, the earliest steps after uh, a hematopoietic stem cell are known as progenitors. And then as they get closer to the final destination in this chart, they call them precursors. So they're, more, they're just right before the final differentiated cell. 
the common granulocyte progenitor or precursor gives rise to three types of cells that are known as granulocytes as a group and individually known as neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. There's an unknown precursor between the common myeloid progenitor and these other cell types, and the unknown precursor uh, doesn't have a name or particular uh, identif identifying features yet, but probably will in the coming years. But one type of cell that emerges from this unknown precursor is a monocyte, which circulate in the blood, and then they differentiate in the tissues to either macrophages or dendritic cells. The unknown precursor also gives rise to another type of cell known as the mast cell. We'll return to the function of all these cells during the course of this lecture. And then this common erythroid megakaryocyte progenitor uh, gives rise to a megakaryocyte, which is basically a factory for producing platelets. Platelets are involved in blood clotting and wound healing. And then the erythroblast, which is a rapidly dividing nucleated cell, which eventually gives rise to non-dividing uh, red blood cells or erythrocytes that do not have nuclei. Now figure, figure 112 takes the icons on the left and gives you a, a more visual picture of stained, white, uh, of stained cells and what they really look like under the microscope. These are not to scale because a lymphocyte uh, looks here like it's pretty much the same size uh, as a monocyte or a macrophage, but really the monocyte or macrophage might be five or ten times larger than a lymphocyte. But there are some distinguishing features that you'll notice as we go along. Neutrophils have several uh, lobes to their nuclei. We'll come back to that. Um, the, some of the cells have a lot of granules in them that you can see. The dendritic cells have this, these long extensions, um, so they look like dendrites. But in any case, it kind of puts a little face on the cells, a, a reality on the cells that are otherwise illustrated by icons in the text. Now, let's talk about the macrophage. The macrophage, its main function is phagocytosis, the process of taking up material, usually pathogens or debris, from outside the cell, ingesting it, and breaking it up. And it's one of the two major cell types that does this, and these are called phagocytes. It's not a specific name of a cell. It's a type of cell that does phagocytosis. The other phagocyte in the immune system is the neutrophil. So not only does this these phagocytes eat up uh, pathogens, but as I said, they, they eat up cell debris, dying host cells, all kinds of garbage. In fact, macrophages are found in all tissues, and as important as their function is to the innate immune system, they're also important for keeping your tissues clear of debris and, and, and other cellular materials. These are the first cells to respond to any invaders in the tissues. In the previous lecture, I showed you uh, a scrape and then bacteria getting into the tissue and a cell we call generally an effector cell, well, that cell is really a macrophage. Until you get inflammation, you don't have neutrophils in the tissues available to, uh, to do phagocytosis, just the macrophages. The immature form of the, the, the macrophage is the monocyte that circulates in the blood and when it migrates into the tissue, it differentiates into the macrophage. Now, the, the second important function of macrophages besides phagocytosis is to serve as antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. And we'll talk in a couple of lectures about antigen presentation. And really what this means is that they present little fragments of proteins from pathogens on the surface of those cells and present them to T cells to, to let the T cells uh, realize that there's an infection. Going, getting ahead of myself. So while we're on the subject of monocyte-derived cells, we've talked about macrophages. The next one I want to talk about is a dendritic cell. These cells come in two forms, the immature dendritic cell and the mature dendritic cell. Uh, they, have, they act differently, and they're in different places in the body. The immature dendritic cells, they're living in the tissues, just like the macrophages, uh, and they're constantly taking up fluid and material from outside the cell. It's not necessarily in response to infection, but they're just constantly sampling the environment. And they do this through processes that have uh, long and complicated names that you'll see in the text that you don't have to remember, like macropinocytosis. Uh, but just imagine them as, as something that's constantly eating and sampling their environment. If the, during one of the sampling exercises they actually take up a pathogen, 
and they recognize that pathogen, his, here's where they change their function. They change from an immature dendritic cell to a mature dendritic cell, and they migrate out of the tissues into the local lymph nodes. And there they serve as antigen-presenting cells, as APCs to T cells. So you can think of them as cellular messengers that inform lymphocytes in the lymph nodes of an infection in a nearby tissue. So they actually are now appreciated as the crucial bridge between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. As I go through the lecture and the last lecture, you'll probably notice that I'm standing up here sort of reading from the notes, and, and everything I say is more or less in the notes. I try not to read verbatim, verbatim all the time, uh, but you don't have to look down at the notes all the time. You can just sort of listen and look at the figures. I will cover all the material that's important to cover. So let's talk about the granulocytes. As I said, there are three types, all ending in fill, and that has to do with uh, how they stain with different kinds of stains that are used by hematologists, the neutrophil, the eosinophil, and the basophil. They all have granules inside the cell. You can see this very well uh, with the basophil, maybe with the eosinophil as well. Uh, not as clear here with the neutrophil. But the, the granules have proteins that are toxic to pathogens, and they can also contain toxic gases and free radicals and so forth, uh, and we'll learn about those in the innate immune lectures. They also produce a class of, of bioactive lipids uh, or different classes such as prostaglandins and leukotrienes that you may have learned about that are involved in inflammation and pain. Uh, they also produce proteins, particularly cytokines, that amplify the inflammatory response by recruiting and activating other cells and also by acting on the epithelial cells and endothelial cells to change permeability and, and, and so on. Now, where the macrophage is the first responder, once the neutrophils get into the tissue and the other granulocytes, they can amplify that response through secretion of more cytokines. In many textbooks and in the clinic, you might hear uh, neutrophils referred to as polymorphonuclear leukocytes, or PMNs, and that's because they have this polymorphic nucleus uh, that's divided into two or three different sections that you can visualize under the microscope. Now, neutrophils in particular, but also the eosinophils and basophils, are fairly short-lived. Macrophages can live for years or decades in the tissues before they're replaced by new monocytes. Many lymphocytes live for a long time as well. These are rapidly produced, constantly produced, and have a short lifespan, and they can be <coughs> produced in even larger numbers in response to infection or inflammation. Figure 115 gives you a general idea of how abundant these are in the blood. You can see the neutrophils are the most abundant. Uh, there's not as many eosinophils and very few basophils. You have quite a few monocytes and a lot of lymphocytes. I will not ask you to write down these numbers on any sort of exam. It's just so that you can see uh, neutrophils are, are very, very important and very abundant in the blood. And that, those percentages can go up in response to infection. And that is shown in figure 116. Uh, there's a large reserve of neutrophils just hanging out in the bone marrow. And when you have an infection and inflammation, these are, are recruited out of the bone marrow. They travel to the infected tissue, squeeze through the blood vessels, and here they can amplify or help out with the macrophages, which are trying to fight the battle but may not have enough of them. Now you have many, many neutrophils who come in, and they're really professional phagocytes that clear up and take care of the remaining bacteria. After that, they die. Macrophages will continue to live, but neutrophils, once they've done their job, uh, will die off. If you have some sort of genetic uh, disease where you don't make enough neutrophils, or you have uh, being treated for cancer, or you're otherwise affected by radiation and so forth, uh, you will not make enough neutrophils. And this is one of the big dangers in cancer therapy and in radiation disease is uh, the loss of neutrophils, which are, are so absolutely critical to dealing with bacterial infections. What about eosinophils? They also have an oddly shaped nucleus, uh, and they stain uh, orange with this acidic stain called eosin, which is how they got the name. You don't see that in this particular stain, but uh, you would if you used the stain called eosin. As I mentioned, you don't have a lot of them in the circulation. 
Most of them are found in the tissues, usually in the connective tissues that are underneath the epithelial layers of the, of the lungs, of the gut, and of the urinary tract. So they're, they're, not, in, they're not recruited in the blood in response to inflammation in, in tissues. They're kind of pre-existing underneath the areas where pathogens might be trying to invade. Now, one of the major roles of eosinophils is to deal with parasites that are too large to be taken up by phagocytosis. A lot of the parasites we deal with are eukaryotic parasites, and their cells, they may be multicellular parasites. They're much larger than our own neutrophils or macrophages. Eosinophils have a way of dealing with these large extracellular parasites. But eosinophils in the lungs in particular are also responsible for tissue damage in allergies and asthma. Uh, for the basophils, uh, they stain with basic dyes like hematoxylin, which is why they're called basophils. Uh, and as you can see, they're not very abundant in the blood, and not that much is known about them, although there's been a kind of a renaissance in studies of basophils the last few years, and probably the next version of the textbook will have a lot more information. It's thought that they have a similar function to mast cells, uh, which we'll get to later, which are involved in allergy, that you can see that they have, uh, they're written as having similar granules. Uh, but whereas mast cells are, are resident in tissues, just like eosinophils and macrophages, basophils are recirculating. Uh, and the, lastly, recent evidence suggests that basophils can undergo a remarkable transformation in response to allergic uh, detection, allergy detection. They can change their, their uh, morphology, migrate to lymph nodes, and behave like dendritic cells in presenting, antigen, <laughs> presenting antigens to T cells. So they may be a newly uh, recognized class of antigen-presenting cell. Since that's not in the book yet, I'm not going to ask you to know that, uh, but it's just something you may want to be aware of in case it comes up uh, later on in your education uh, so that you know that there's been progress in understanding basophils and they may have functions similar to dendritic cells. Okay, come back to that. So, any questions so far? Good. This is really just a, a laundry list, a parts list. We've got to get through it, but please, uh, if there's something that's not clear, feel free to speak up. We'll talk about B cells. They produce antibody. And then the, the official term for antibody is immunoglobulin, which we will abbreviate as Ig in this class. And I, Ig comes in two forms. It comes in this, the cell surface form that's shown here on, these, on this resting B cell. And in that form, it's known as the B-cell receptor, or BCR. And we'll talk about BCR signaling and recognition of antigen in lectures about B-cell activation. Once the B-cell recognizes the antigen through the BCR, then it differentiates into a plasma cell, which is basically an antibody-producing factory. And in this case, the antibodies are secreted and not membrane-bound. And the secreted form of the immunoglobulin, as I mentioned, is called antibody. The second major function of B cells is to serve as an antigen presenting cell to T cells. And remember from the last lecture that each B cell in your body has a slightly different sequence of its BCR so that the antigens that it can recognize are different from each other. T cells, coded in blue here, Actually, if you look under the microscope, you cannot distinguish a B cell and a T cell. They are very similar size, uh, went before activated. They have their own antigen receptor, known as the TCR, or T cell receptor. It has a, a different structure, and it recognizes the antigen differently. And we'll spend a few lectures talking about antigen recognition by the BCR versus the TCR. Among the T cells, there are two major classes. They're known as helper T lymphocytes and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And for the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, we will abbreviate them CTL. You can distinguish these using antibodies that, this, that recognize cell surface proteins on the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells, T lymphocytes. The helper T cells express CD4, the CTLs express CD8. We're gonna learn a lot more molecules that start with CD uh, and later on, I'll explain to you where the CD designation came from. 
But the first two that you'll learn about, and perhaps the most important is to know, understand as immunologists, are CD4 and CD8, which are used to classify the helper T lymphocytes from the CTLs. What do the helper T cells do? Uh, they're really kind of the generals of the immune system that direct traffic and direct other cells what to do and help them get their work done better. And they do this in large part by secretion of cytokines. And different cytokines are made to help macrophages versus B cells versus CTLs and other cells that need help from the, the helper T cells. Interestingly, there, there are subtypes of CD4 T cells that are, are not really helper T cells after all. In fact, they're, they suppress immune responses, and we call them regulatory T cells, and you'll learn about them as well. What do CTLs do? Well, they're cytotoxic. They kill other cells. That's their job. They can secrete cytokines, but their, their primary responsibility is to detect virally infected cells or cancer cells and kill them. Now, um, B cells and T cells both spend much of their time just wandering around the blood. And the lymphoid organs that we'll learn about in the second part of the course, uh, this lecture, uh, and they recognize antigen first in those, those organs. And then they, they may migrate out of those organs later on to, to go to specific tissues to deal with the infection. OK. Now, NK cells, they're really more of, of a, they're, they're like a CTL but not as powerful, and they can't distinguish different types of antigens. But they're a first line of defense that can kill virally infected cells and cancer cells. They don't express a TCR or a BCR, so the receptors are not different from one NK cell to the next. And so they're considered part of innate immunity. They're also slightly larger than the T cells and the B cells, and they have recognizable granules. So you can distinguish NK cells from T cells and B cells under the microscope. Sometimes they're called large granular lymphocytes because of that feature. So lastly, the one cell we haven't covered yet is the mast cell. I did mention it's a major cell type involved in allergy. An allergy is the response to an allergen, recognizing an allergen. And what is an allergen? It's basically a non-harmful antigen, something foreign that shouldn't cause you any problems, but nevertheless, your immune system sees it as foreign and generates a response that can cause a, a nuisance or even very dangerous conditions to the host. And the mast cells mediate these responses by releasing the contents of their granules, <coughs> including a substance known as histamine, which you've heard about when you take antihistamines. You're trying to counteract the effects of the histamine released from mast cells when you have an allergic reaction. All right, that's it for the cells. Next, we're on to the organs. Any questions about the cells? Just, yeah. You said the histamines do what? Histamine is a, a secreted product that's involved in the allergic symptoms. It makes your nose run, uh, makes your skin itch. It has a lot of active uh, activities to make you feel all the symptoms of allergy. And antihistamines basically block those. In the Right. So in that diagram, it's not specific, but I'm assuming the effector T cells are just those two. Effector T cells are, are activated versions of the helper, and the helper and CTLs. Yes, when T cells recognize antigen, then they develop the ability to do those things, secrete cytokines or kill other cells. Uh, the resting T cell has CD4 or CD8 on it, but it's not yet capable of either helping other cells or killing other cells. In the process of proliferation and clonal expansion, they differentiate into effector T cells, which have those properties I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do regulatory T cells suppress? What do regulatory T cells suppress? Uh, they suppress, they act on both the dendritic cell and T cells to prevent the activation. Uh, and they're, they're generally there to make to kind of prevent autoimmune disease or overactive responses to pathogens. Uh, you will learn about regulatory T cells later. If you don't have regulatory T cells, you develop, uh, there, there are humans with this disease, uh, it, a fa rapidly fatal autoimmune disease. Yes. Is the only difference difference between neutrophils and macrophages? There are thousands of differences. I mean, the, they, uh, macrophages are present all the time in all tissues. Uh, 
They are responsible for cleaning up debris. They uh, have different receptors than neutrophils. They don't crawl after, they don't chase after bacteria the same way neutrophils do. We'll learn about a lot of other differences later. Yeah. I think maybe really the job of neutrophils is to enter areas of infection and, and digest bacteria and then die. Macrophages live a long time. They have a lot of different jobs, and they don't really chase after bacteria in the way that neutrophils do. If the bacteria shows up, they deal with it, uh, and then they get help from the neutrophils. Okay. Really, this is just a beginning overview. You will learn a lot more about each of these cell types later. It just helps to have this framework so you can begin to understand how the immune system works. Now, the organs of the immune system are shown in figure 118, and they're divided into what are known as primary lymphoid organs and secondary lymphoid organs. Primary, sometimes called central lymphoid organs, and the secondary are sometimes called peripheral lymphoid organs. And basically what we mean is that the primary or central lymphoid organs are where the cells are produced. It's where the cells are generated. It's the site of hematopoiesis. And the secondary or peripheral lymphoid organs is where the, the lymphocytes get activated in response to infection. There's only two primary lymphoid organs, so it's very simple. The bone marrow and the thymus over here, shown in red. The bone marrow in this picture is just shown uh, in the long bone of, of the leg, the femur. But you find bone marrow in the sternum, the vertebrae, uh, other large bones, you find it in ribs, you find some in cranium, long bones of the arms and lower legs. So any large bone that has uh, some space inside can be a site of, of bone marrow. And it's really where you have the development, the proliferation, uh, and the di differentiation of the stem cells into the progenitors and the precursors, and finally, all the mature cells of the immune system. The one exception is the T cell, which finishes its development in the thymus. At that step where you split between, from the, chronic, uh, the, the common lymphoid progenitor to the NK T cell precursor, the cells leave the bone marrow and take up residence in the thymus, which is a, an organ that has two lobes to it, so you can kind of see this reverse heart shape. It's right above the heart. And this is where the T cells mature and where they undergo selection. By that I mean a process that removes self-reactive T cells before they can cause damage to the host. And we'll learn a lot about selection of T cells and B cells later on in the course and why it's important to remove and select only, to remove the bad ones and select the good ones to survive. The, the, cell, the T cell undergoing development and maturation in the thymus is known as a thymocyte during that stage. Okay, so we're going to take our first uh, lecture break now, and I'm not going to show you something topical from, from the news. I'm just going to have a little bit of active learning here to see whether you were paying attention for the last five minutes. And what I like to do in these sessions is to have you just um, exchange a few sentences or greetings with the person you're sitting next to and try to answer the question, uh, and then we'll have a show of hands <coughs> afterwards and see what everybody comes up with. So this is a really easy one to get started. My question is, what would cause a worse immunodeficiency if you were to remove all the bone marrow from somebody or if you were to move their thymus? And think about what, why that would be. Okay. <laughs>
So who thinks it would be worse to remove the thymus? One or two. Who thinks it would be worse to remove the bone marrow? OK, the majority is right. If you remove the bone marrow, you wouldn't be able to make anything in the entire uh, family tree, including T cells. If you remove the thymus only, you just wouldn't be able to produce mature T cells. Uh, and so there's actually a strain of mice known as a nude mouse, um, which doesn't have any hair. It's missing a transcription factor required for making hair, but that transcription factor is also required for making the thymus. And uh, it survives pretty well in, if, as long as you don't, as long as you keep the cages clean and so forth. It's not, it's, it's not going to die of massive bacterial infections as it would if it didn't have bone marrow. But it's really useful as a laboratory strain because without T cells, it can't reject uh, uh, organ grafts. So it's, it's used a lot to study, uh, for example, human cancers. You can inject human cancers under the skin of these mice and they grow in a, in a more physiological environment than they would in a Petri dish. But just to illustrate uh, what you can do with a mouse like this, you can actually graft on a human ear um, and it's not rejected from the mouse. Uh, so that, uh, it, they're, they're basically, without T cells, they can't reject graft, but they're otherwise pretty healthy. For decades, the nude mouse was the commonly used strain to study human cancer growth in animals. Now there are more sophisticated models where there's no T cells and no B cells and no NK cells, and they've been much better. Uh, they're much better at um, accepting grafts of all different types. Of course, they're a lot more immunosuppressed, and so you have to keep them in the very, very sterile conditions. Okay, so far we've just been talking about cells and listing their properties. It's been fairly simple conceptually. Uh, now we want to kind of go more 3D and talk about how cells move around uh, the, the, the body and what is happening in the, lymph in the, in the secondary lymphoid organs uh, as cells communicate with each other. Let's go back to this picture here and talk about the secondary lymphoid organs shown in yellow. And let's start first by showing these kind of grayish uh, lines here. These are the lymphatic vessels. They're not an organ per se, but they're really an essential component of the immune system. It's, a, it's an entire, sec entire secondary vascular system. I'm sure you're all aware of arteries and veins and capillaries, but you have a, a completely uh, separate vascular system known as the lymphatic system that's carrying all the, the fluid out from the tissues uh, towards the lymph nodes, and it's, being, it's filtering this lymph through the lymph nodes. If there's any antigens in that lymph, then you can start an adaptive immune response in those lymph nodes. So the lymphatic vessels collect fluids, proteins, and cells that have leaked out of the other vascular system, the blood, and uh, that are now in the tissues, and they return them back to the blood. So that's one job, is that all the fluid that's leaking out constantly are in inflammation, and the cells that come out, they've got to find their way back to the blood eventually. The lymphatics bring that back. But they also uh, will bring any pathogens or pieces of pathogens to the local lymph nodes for sampling. The lymphatic vessels are also the, hi the highway that dend dendritic cells use to move from the tissues into the lymph nodes, uh, carrying along the antigens that they're ready to present as well. The fluid in the lymphatic vessels is called the lymph, and the, the fluid that's entering a lymph node is known as the afferent lymph, and the fluid that's leaving the lymph node is known as the efferent lymph. So let's move here. Okay, so here's a very simplified diagram of how lymphocytes recirculate. Uh, red is an artery, or pink is an artery, blue is a vein, uh, and you can see that um, at the capillaries, capillaries kind of connect the arteries and veins, and they also underlie the lymph node. And some cells from the circulation will squeeze out of those capillaries and enter the lymph node. So you can see in yellow some lymphocytes. Uh, some will continue on uh, in the vein, but most of them will, will actually leak out into lymph nodes. And then through the efferent lymphatic, leave the lymph node and eventually make it back into the circulation right before they get to the heart. 
So that's also shown here. Um, here you have an infected peripheral tissue near this guy's ankle. Pathogens and dendritic cells from the site reach the lymph nodes via lymphatics. This is called the draining lymph node, uh, which is the, the specific lymph node where the antigens and pathogens first go. You have the arterial blood and the venous blood, uh, and the, lymph, the lymphocytes uh, which enter the lymph node and sample the antigen will eventually return through the lymphatic system <clears throat> and return to the blood at this site here known as the thoracic duct, which empties into the left subclavian vein. I think it's shown here. So again, this is a, a more of a fine structure of a lymph node, which looks it's sort of like a kidney bean shaped uh, structure. In a, in a human, they're about a centimeter. In a mouse, they're like a millimeter across. And you can see that there's kind of an outer capsule, and the afferent lymphatic is coming in this way. Here's another one over here. And then the efferent lymphatic is just leaving the lymph node to go to another lymph node or go to the thoracic duct is coming out the other side. And you can see that the, the lymph node has a, a structure that we'll talk about in a minute where there are different sections. But I just wanted to illustrate the concept that the lymph node is a place where lymph comes in through the afferent lymphatics along with pathogens, dendritic cells, and fragments of antigens, and eventually uh, leaves. And again, it shows you here the artery and the vein. And if you can imagine, behind the lymph node is where those arteries and veins meet at the capillaries. As the white blood cells go through those capillaries, the T cells and B cells in particular squeeze out of the walls of those capillaries and enter the lymph node where they can uh, sample for antigens. The vast majority of the time, there's no antigen coming through the afferent lymphatics. It's just cells and fluid and nothing dangerous. And the B and T cells wander around for a while, and then they just leave and go back. They go to another lymph node, or they go back into circulation. But if the afferent lymphatics are carrying any antigens in and dendritic cells presenting those antigens, that's when immune responses happen and things get interesting and you get uh, new structures developing in the lymph node in response to the infection. So before we get into the fine structure of the lymph, are these uh, three diagrams clear? Can you see sort of how lymphocytes go about recirculating through the body? Maybe we can put it back on this one. Again, the, lymph, the lymph, lymphocytes are in the, in the blood. There's a lot more of them in the arteries and in the veins because when they get to the capillaries, they enter the lymph nodes, and then they can use the lymph to go to another lymph node or eventually back into the bloodstream. And most of the time when they go to a lymph node, they don't encounter anything dangerous and they just continue on their way. But if an antigen has been brought there and they have a receptor, a BCR or a TCR, that recognizes that antigen, that's when they stop and are clonally selected to proliferate and differentiate. So let's talk a bit more about the lymph nodes. You have clusters of them in different parts of your body. I'm sure you all recognize when you go to the doctors uh, and you have a cold or a flu or something, they'll, they'll try to feel your lymph nodes here to see if they're swollen or they might feel under the arm or wherever the draining lymph node is for the infection that you have to see just you know, how much swelling you have there, how big are those lymph nodes. And uh, you have several of them in each of those places. And, they, and the reason you have a lot under your arm is because that's where all of the lymphatic vessels are draining from that arm and you have other ones under the other arm. And from your head, they're draining into underneath your neck here. As I mentioned, the lymphocytes enter the lymph node by squeezing through the, the walls of the capillaries connecting the arteries and the veins. And they encounter antigens that are presented there by antigen presenting cells, and mainly dendritic cells, but possibly basophils, as has been proposed recently. Now you can see from this diagram that there's an, there are, uh, there's an area of the lymph node that is um, known as a T cell area. It's not 100% T cells, but most of the T cells in the lymph node are found here. And there's another area that's kind of light yellow shaded, which is known as the follicle, which is the place where you'll find most of the B cells. It's in the T cell area where the dendritic cells go, carrying antigen, 
and where they activate the T cells to initiate the immune response. Now, when B cells encounter antigen, and we'll talk about how and where they do that later on, they can form structures in the lymph node known as germinal centers. And this just basically shows the increase in size of, of germinal centers over time in response to infection. If you look at a real lymph node, a cross-section of a real lymph node uh, stained with uh, various dyes, um, you can see the, the B cell areas, the lymphoid follicles actually are, are dense and dark um, purple. And then the germinal centers, and this is from somebody who's infected, have a kind of a lighter color and are, are these round kind of balls in, in the middle of the B cell area. The T cell zone is a little bit less dense. Uh, that would be here. And then there's an, a, regi a region in general known as the medulla that's shown by kind of orange red in this area, which doesn't have as many cells. And then there's cavities from w that eventually drain into the efferent lymphatics is known as the medullary sinus. So this is a bit of an anatomy of a lymph node. You need to remember that there's afferent lymphatic vessels, efferent lymphatic vessels, a T cell zone, follicles with mostly B cells. When B cells are activated, they form germinal centers. And then everything drains out through the medulla and through these medullary sinuses uh, to go to the efferent lymphatics. There's one other sinus, again, which is a word for an empty cavity, which is basically on the outer capsule area of the lymph node. Uh, which is where this, the cells and fluid collects after coming in from the afferent lymphatic vessel. It's useful to really understand this architecture because we're going to come back to it in, in, when we put immune responses together and study how T cells and B cells communicate. Okay, so I just want to show Another image that illustrates this whole process. Uh, OK, we've kind of come back to the figure we showed last time where there's been some sort of a scrape and a little wound healing here. Macrophages have taken up bacteria and are secreting cytokines, which allowed neutrophils to come in, and you have some inflammation. Here's a dendritic cell that's been taking up uh, material outside, and it's detected the presence of a bacteria. Now what happens then is the neutrophils start, to, the dendritic cells start to mature. They leave the tissue along with any bacteria that have not been digested and little fragments of bacteria that have been killed and spit out by macrophages. All that stuff comes along in the afferent lymph and goes to the draining lymph node, which is the closest lymph node where this lymph is going to be uh, filtered through. You have some more macrophages in the lymph nodes themselves, just to deal with any intact pathogens that might have made it that far. Dendritic cells take up residence in the T cell zone, and they present antigens to T cells, which are indicated uh, uh, in green here, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure which is green and which is blue, but in any case, you have activated T cells and B cells. Eventually, the B cells mature and differentiate into plasma cells that can secrete antibodies. And the antibodies can leave through the efferent lymphatics to do their job elsewhere, eventually make it back in the circulation to deal with any pathogens that are still here. Uh, and activated T cells will also leave through the efferent lymphatics and can go help the macrophages at the site of infection. OK, the spleen is the second uh, peripheral or secondary lymphoid organ that I want to talk about. It's shown in figure 123. It's a large organ that's found behind your stomach. And much as lymph nodes filter the lymph, the spleen, one of its major jobs is to filter the blood, not in the way that, that, the, that the kidney filters the blood to get rid of uh, you know, wastes, or the liver filters the blood to deal with toxins. The spleen filters the blood to deal with antigens. It collects antigens uh, and deals with them in a specific part of the spleen known as the white pulp. The spleen is a large red organ. Its, its second job is to uh, dispose of old red blood cells. And that's actually the, the larger volume of the spleen is dealing with old red blood cells. So it's a very uh, bright purplish red organ. But within the red pulp are these little areas of white pulp, which actually um, structurally look a lot like lymph nodes. So there's a bunch of little lymph nodes embedded in this larger organ here. 
And if you look at, at a cross section of one of those white pulp sections, it's not identical, but the, again, there are areas where T cells are concentrated, there are areas where B cells are concentrated and color coded the same in this figure. And then if there's an antigen, you develop a germinal center. So the main function of the spleen is to initiate immune responses to antigens in the blood, shown in the notes as blood-borne antigens, whereas lymph nodes respond to antigens in tissues. But again, you have all the same players, T cells and B cells, dendritic cells that are in the blood and the spleen that take up uh, antigens will bring them into the T cell zone to present and initiate immune responses. Uh, for now, we will ignore the picture over here. Later on, we'll come back perhaps to talk about some of the features shown in this in a later lecture. And lastly, I want to talk about the mucosal lymphoid organs. Now, you probably have more mucosal lymphoid tissue than you do by adding up all your lymph nodes and your spleen together. It's just very diffuse. It's all over the place in small little patches. You basically have mucosal lymphoid tissue underlying uh, your lungs, your gut, other epithelial tissues. Uh, it's just they're not concentrated in large globs that are easily dissected out and visualized. And the mucosal lymphoid or, uh, tissue altogether is known as the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or MALT. And it's really sometimes divided into two uh, subtypes of MALT known as GALT and BALT. So here is where your nomenclature gets kind of complicated and annoying. But um, if you look at the gut associated lymphoid tissue, again, you will find that you, even though th this might be one tenth the size of a lymph node in its overall uh, diameter, this little area under the epithelium of the gut is very organized. You have T cell areas, B cell areas, a germinal center, dendritic cells in the T cell areas, and efferent lymphatics. So, uh, and if this is a, um, a cross-section of a real gut stain. You can see, again, T cell areas, um, a B cell areas, and a, and a germinal center. And there's another type of cell, which we may learn about more later, called an M cell, which is involved in gathering antigens uh, that are brought into this gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So what is the gut-associated lymphoid tissue? A lot of them you've heard of, the tonsils that some people have removed, uh, which are underlying the trachea. You have the adenoids, the appendix. Peyer's patches are, are these patchy areas of lymphoid tissue underneath the gut. Uh, and then the other, the BALT, is the bronchial associated lymphoid tissue, all this diffuse lymphoid structures that are underlying the bronchio, uh, bronchioles of your lungs. So I think that that's all I have for today. Any questions about the organs part of this lecture? <laughs>